this morning, as I said, we will continue our study in 1 Corinthians, and we will find ourselves in chapter 3, but we'll actually start reading towards the end of chapter 1, just to kind of get an idea of where we are going. And for those of you that do not know, or do know, or may have forgotten, as we're walking through Paul's letter to the 1 Corinthians, his first letter to the Corinthians, one of the central themes that we're trying to bring out is this issue of identity. Who does the Lord want us to be? Who does the Lord want His people to be? Yeah. Just as the DNA gives direction to our bodies so that it might grow appropriately, the Lord has given us the Spirit guide us into maturity. And just like in the physical world, if I tried to live against the wiring of my DNA, I would suffer consequences. If I try to eat like a dog, I will suffer consequences because my dog, my stomach is not meant to be the stomach of a dog. It's different. DNA wired me that way. God wired my DNA to be that way. And spiritually, the same thing is true. If we try living our lives as individuals and our lives as a community differently from the Lord's design, then we consequences. But if we align our lives, both with our DNA and both with our spiritual DNA, with the wisdom of the Lord, then we will flourish. We will find true life. We will bear fruit. And that's the desire here, that we as a church, as we walk through Paul's letter to the Corinthians, that we would grow that we will be able to see these things that I am doing in my life are good. I will continue pursuing them. These things I'm doing in my life, well, they're not so good. I need to turn away from them. And these other things, they might be good, but they're actually not important. They're not necessary. And they're hurting me more than they're doing me good. So I'm going to turn away from them as well. And that's the goal, that we would grow. That the Lord would search us and try us and that He would guide us in His wisdom so that we would grow and we would conform our lives to the will of the Lord. And so we will begin reading in chapter 1, verse 18. And before we do that, the reason why is because as we walk through Corinthians, I've been trying to point out that the, the central question... Oh, there it is. Wait. It's working now, Charles. That the central identity, the DNA that the Lord has provided for us is to understand that we are this. We are the people who have been called by the Lord Jesus. That's number one. We must understand that the Lord, we are here. We are servants of the Lord because He called us. Not because we woke up one day and said, huh, I'm going to serve the Lord. And if we did do that, we did that because He called us. He opened our eyes. It's not because we are smarter it's not because we got better uh, training up when we were children. It's because the Lord was merciful towards us. There's no room for bragging. There's no room for pride. We are here because the Lord called us. And He called us to be His holy people. To be the ones who would reflect His image. Who, to be the ones who would live like Him. And who would live for Him. That's what being holy means. It means you can have access into God's presence. And then you can go into the world and show the world what He is like. It's the language of priests. The language of priesthood. Who can, who can go into the temple, into the sanctuary, the, the, the dwelling place of God, enter His presence, and then go back into the world and represent Him. And that's who you and I are meant to be. And that's why I've said that's why we don't have priests. Because we all are priests. We all have access to God's presence. We all can offer sacrifices. We all can represent Him to the world if you have the Spirit of God. And there's a third piece here. We've been called by the Lord Jesus to be His holy people. And if we forget this third piece, we will live a life of unfruitfulness. It's this, that we are called to be His holy people in a corrupt world. He did not call us just so that we can benefit from it, so that we can enjoy the ride. He called us so that we would be instruments of His life-changing power, of His grace in the midst of a corrupted world. 
And so the central question that Paul is trying to deal with in this letter to the Corinthians is this question, I think. It says, how should we, the Corinthians and we here at Unity in Youngsville and Wake Forest, how should we live as the Lord's holy people in the midst of a corrupt world? What does that look like? What does that look like for us as individuals? What does that look like for us as a community? That's what I think he's addressing in all the 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians. How do we live as the Lord's holy people? And I, and I want to do a plug here. I want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday afternoons, if you can, at 2 o'clock, or Friday nights. We are trying, during those times, to go a little bit deeper into these passages. There are things that we can't cover here on Sunday morning. We don't have time. So Wednesdays and Friday nights give us an opportunity to dive a little bit further. We'll be doing that this week. So join us if you can, Wednesday at 2 and Fridays at 6.30. What does this look like in our everyday lives? And so, Paul gives us the answer. His first answer is this. We must conform our entire way of thinking and our entire way of living, not to the culture, not to what we want, not to what comes natural, but to the will of the Lord. He's the one that created us. He's the one that redeemed us. And He's the one that's going to raise us from the grave. We conform a way of thinking, a way of living to His will. Not the will of man, not my will, not your will. And within this, the, the entire letter of 1 Corinthians is broken into several pieces. And the first piece of that is this, that to be the Lord's holy people, we must be a united people. And so two weeks ago, we walked through the first, the, the, uh, the first part of this. What does it look like to be a united people? If we're to be His holy people, His holy representatives, the one that can access His presence, the one that can show the world what He's like, we must live united. And He breaks this down into several sections, which is why we need to read this again. Starting in verse 18, the first part is, what does it look like? What does it mean? What does it entail to be a united people? First, it means we must reject the wisdom of the world. Because the wisdom of the world leads to division. The wisdom of the world is based on the things you can see with your eyes, the things you can hear with your ears. It leads to comparison. This is better. That's worse. This guy's better looking. That guy's a better speaker. This girl is a better leader. We will follow her. This way is better. If we follow the wisdom of the world, it will lead to division. It will lead to factions. These people look like me. These ones don't. So I will hang out with these. These ones have the same financial situation I have. These ones don't, so I won't even go near those. That's the wisdom of the world. And Jesus says, reject that. It leads to division. Last week, Chris uh, brought the message for, uh, to us from chapter 2. And chapter 2 brings out, you reject the wisdom of the world, but hold on a second, there is wisdom. And that if we're to be a united people, we need to pursue the wisdom of God because it leads to maturity. It leads to us growing up. We as believers cannot be infants for the rest of our lives. In the same way that I hope one day Mariah will stop crying like that. Because she won't be an infant anymore. She won't be a baby anymore. But does that come naturally? No. We have to feed her. We have to correct her. We have to lead her. We have to train her. We have to teach her. And little by little, she will become an adult. And if she doesn't, then we would say, well, there's something wrong. Something's off. And she will suffer for it. Because she will be expected to live like an adult, and yet she won't be ready for it. The same thing is true of us as believers. The same thing is true of us as a church. As a community, we must not be content with being infants the rest of our lives. And it does not come naturally. That's what we saw last week. It's something you have to pursue. You have to feed. You have to eat. You have to train. You have to correct. You have to, to say yes to some things. You have to say no to other things. It does not be natural. And today, we'll see part three. What does it mean to be united people? What's this? In our passage, that we must use this wisdom, the Lord's wisdom, to build one another up, not to break one another. This is what it entails to be a united people. 
We reject the wisdom of the world. We pursue the wisdom of the Lord. And then we use that wisdom of the Lord, not just for ourselves, but to build others up, not to break them down. That's where we are. So read with me, if you could, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 18, and we'll read through chapter 3. I understand it's a little portion, but the Word calls us to understand His Word. Sometimes that requires that we would read a little bit longer. That requires that we would focus a little bit harder. The Word calls us to mature, and that requires to eat not just milk, but solid food. And so start in chapter 1, verse... We'll start in verse 10, actually, because that's where it begins. I appeal to you, my brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Because it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you. My brothers, what I'm saying is this. Each one of you is going around saying, oh, I follow Paul, or I follow Paul, sir. I follow Cephas, sir. Uh, I follow Christ. <coughs> Let me ask you this. Is Christ divided? Is Paul the one who was crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I got baptized in none of you except Christus and Gaius. But no one may say that you were baptized in <coughs> my name. Now, I did baptize the household of Stephan, was also in beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. Because Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with words, but with <coughs> wisdom, lest the cross be empty. Empty of its power, your translation might have. Verse 18. And here's why. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us, who are being saved, it's the power of God. After all, it's written, I, that's the Lord, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning, discerning, I will thwart. So tell me this, Paul asks, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Get him. Let me ask you this, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Because since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God, through the folly and foolishness of what we preach, to save those who believe. Because, look around. The Jews, they demand science. The Greeks seek wisdom. And we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block for the Jews. Folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, well, Jews and from the Greeks. Christ is the power of God. The wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God, if God could be a fool, is wiser than men. And the weakness of God, if God could be weak, is stronger than men. Brothers, consider this. Consider your calling. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world. To shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not. Why? To bring shame, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why did he do this, you might be asking? Verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And it's because of him that you are in Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So, as it's written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Brothers, think, of, think about it. When I came to you, I did not come to you proclaiming the testimony or the mystery of God with lofty speech or wisdom. No, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. Even my speech and my message, they weren't in fancy, plausible words of wisdom, but they were in the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. Why did I come to you this way? Verse 5, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Verse 5, don't get carried away just yet, because there is a wisdom. 
Among the mature, verse 6, yeah, among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although, it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age. They're doomed to pass away. You see, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed or he preordained before the ages of our world. None of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had understood this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But after all, it's written, What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, yes, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things are the very things that God has revealed to us. And he's done this through the Spirit. Because the Spirit searches everything. <coughs> Even the depths of God. Think with me. Who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him? And also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So verse 12, now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why did we receive the spirit? So that we might understand the things that have been freely given to us by God. We impart this in words not thought, not taught by human wisdom, but words that are taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. You see, the natural person, the person of the flesh, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they can only be understood spiritually. Verse 15. Now the spiritual person understands and judges all things, and he himself will not be judged by anyone. For tell me this, who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have received the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1. But I, brothers, oh brothers and sisters, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. And even now, you're still not ready. How do I know this? Because you're of the flesh. Because while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? Are you not behaving only in a human way? For when one goes around saying, Oh, I follow Paul, and another follows, I follow Paul, tell me this, are you not being just like regular men, like humans? Verse 5. What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Let me tell you. They're servants. Servants through whom you believe. That's it. And at and to each as the Lord assigned. You see, I planted Apollos watered, but God is the one who gave the growth. So that neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters, are, are, they're one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, because we are God's fellow worker, yet God's field God's building. That's you. You are God's field. You are God's building. Not my field, not my building, Paul said. Verse 10. And according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. So let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation of gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest because the day will disclose it. It will be revealed by fire. The fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation stands or survives or remains, he will receive a reward. If anyone's, work, if, if, though, uh, if anyone's work is burnt up in the process, he will suffer great loss. 
No, he himself, he said, but only as to fire. Do you not know that you're God's temple? That God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Because God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So, verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he's wise in this age, let him become a fool, so that he may become really wise, truly wise. Because the wisdom of this world is folly with God. After all, it's written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, in another place. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, but they are just futile. So, verse 21. Let the one who boasts, let no one boast in men. After all, all things are yours. Whether Paul, or Paulus, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, everything is yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So we'll stop there. But he, does, he continues to chapter 4. I want to encourage you, brothers. Get in the habit, brothers and sisters, get in the habit of reading long portions of Scripture. When the authors wrote things down, they wrote them to try to convey a meaning, a purpose. And you cannot understand it if you read little chunks here and there, a one verse at a time. You will completely misunderstand it, just like you would completely misunderstand a movie if you watched it 30 seconds at a time. Nobody does that. Nobody sits down to read a novel, a fiction book, one sentence at a time. Why would we do that to the Word of God? We think about that. Reading those three chapters took us maybe ten minutes. We spent ten minutes doing worse things. Why not take out ten, fifteen minutes of our day and read two, three, four, five chapters of the Bible? We could read most of Paul's letters in less than fifteen minutes. And they were meant to be read as letters. If we don't do that, then, then a, a, a fancy speaking preacher can stand up here and make the Bible say whatever he wants it to say. And if you don't know what the Bible says, then you chew it all up. Our job, beloved, is to grow, to understand what the Word says, so that you can hold me accountable. We can hold one another accountable. And that requires reading large portions. And there's lots we can cover here, and we won't be able to do everything, but I hope we can go a little bit further this morning, a little bit further on Friday and on Wednesday. And here, Paul seems to be coming back to a similar point that he started. All right, so track with me again. To be the Lord's holy people, we must be united. We cannot be divided. And in order for us to be united, one, that's verses 18 through chapter 2, 5, we must reject the wisdom of the world. We can't think like the world anymore. The wisdom of the world leads to rejection, leads to division, and in fact, the wisdom of the world is going to be judged by God. It's rejected by God. It rejects God. Two, that's chapters two, six, to three, four. If we're going to be united, we must pursue the true wisdom, the wisdom of God. This is the wisdom that leads to maturity. We have to pursue it. It will not come down. Think with me. Back in the wilderness. When Israel was walking through the wilderness and the Lord sent manna and each Israelite family was sitting inside their tent. When the Lord sent manna, the manna just appeared on their table. Right? And they just gobbled it up. And then the next day, they got back and they sat down on their breakfast table and they sat there and they said, Lord, send the manna. And the manna just appeared on the table. Right? That's what happened. No. The manna fell where? Outside. And the Lord said, you guys are hungry? I'll stand the manna. But you must do what? You must pursue it. You must collect it. Some can gather more, some can gather less, but nobody lacked anything. That's our job, beloved, as a church. We must pursue it. If all we do is sit inside of our tent and wait for the manna to come, the manna is going to spoil out there. We need to pursue it. We need to be diligent. And this morning, what we, what we see is that to be a united people, we must then take this wisdom of God, this manna from heaven. And we must not let it just sit on our table. We must use it. We must use it to build one another up, not to break one another down. And so we can break this down into a few uh, further sections. 
What does it look like to be a united community of builders? And before I do that, I need to put this on. Now, it's not for anything fancy, and it's not just because of the way I like it, because I like the way it looks. It's so I won't forget. I have a story to tell. And I will forget if I'm not wearing this. Seth, you know you like this. Yeah. <laughs> this is nice, by the way. Yeah. This, don't let me forget, Henry. And this goes with what I'm trying to say, okay? It's so I don't forget. But I actually think it looks good. Yeah. I've always wanted to be Sylvester Stallone and Rocky Balboa. Yo, Adrian. Uh, what does it look like to be a community of builders? That's what he's saying here, chapter 2 in his box. To be a community of builders. He uses several images. And we can break this down to three pieces. We look, start in verse 5, all the way through, through verse 9. He asks this question. What then is Apollos? Look, chapter 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? You guys are bickering about these leaders? What are they? They're just servants. They're the ones through whom you believe. Sure, I planted Apollos water, but who gave the growth? God gave the growth. Sure, we did this, we did that, but who's the one that should get the attention? God should get the attention. And that's what Paul's saying. If we're to be a united community of believers, we need to understand that everything we have is from the Lord. If we benefited from good teachers in the past, the present, or perhaps the future, our job is not to elevate those good preachers, those good teachers. Our job is to give thanks to the Lord for them. Just like in a garden, the image he uses here, the one that brings about the growth is who is the Lord. If we are to be a united community of builders, we need to understand this simple message that the Lord is the one who gives us everything. We have what we have, and we are what we are by the grace of the Lord. If we forget this, then we will start elevating different people. And we will start turning things around, <coughs> upside down in their heads. And then we will be led to division. We need to understand we have what we have, we are what we are, because of the Lord. And if this is the case, then we need to boast in Him. We need to boast in Him. It is so dangerous. We see this so many times in our culture where Christians will elevate these leaders, these preachers, into a celebrity-like status and will follow them unto death, not to mention the Colts. The Colts. Colts. Not the Colts. The football team. Colts. Is that what he said? C-U-L-T-S. Colts. Colts. <clears throat> Not the Indianapolis Colts. No, no, no. The cult. A cult. They'll follow this man. They'll follow this woman unto death sometimes. Paul's saying, guys, we're just, we're just servants. If you see somebody standing up here teaching, preaching behind his pulpit, there's nothing special about the pulpit. It's made of wood. Who made the wood? The Lord made the wood. There's nothing special about the preacher. Who made the preacher? The Lord made the preacher. Our boast our priority, our affiliation needs to be in the Lord because if not, then it will lead to division. And each one plays their part. Sure, some plant, some water, but at the end of the day, the Lord gives the growth. This is the Lord's church. That's what we must understand for it to be a community, a united community of builders. And second, notice what he uses there, verse 9. We, he's talking about chapter 3, verse 9, we, that's Apollos, Paul, the leader, we the leaders, he's saying, we are God's fellow workers. We're not the ones who bring the growth. We're just fellow workers. We're high workers. You are God's field, God's house. In fact, the word for house there, you are God's building project. It's God's project. It's God's field. It's not my project, not my field. The Lord, it was here before I was here, it was here before you were here, and it will be here after. So our, that's why we as a church, beloved, need to be intentional about investing in the next generation. I'll say that again. That's why we as a church, beloved, need to be intentional about investing in the next generation. 
Why do you think so many churches die? Because the people in them die. And because the people in them didn't raise up future leaders. Because future leaders don't spring up naturally. Just like crops don't spring up naturally. Weeds spring up naturally. Thorns spring up naturally. Not good crops. And if we are not intentional about raising up the next generation of leaders, the same thing will happen. You will die one day, I will die one day. If we do not train up the next generation to take the baton, to take the torch, and to continue, we will just be another, another bad statistic, another church that died, along with its members. It's happening all around us. There are dozens of churches within a 30-mile radius that are dying. And if we're not careful, we'll put the blame on the next generation. Oh, these young people, they don't want to listen. They don't want to do anything. And the question is, were we ever trying to actually train them? Or were we just speaking at them? Were we showing them how to live, how to love the Lord? Or were we just dumping a bunch of facts and hitting them over the head with the Bible? No, we need to be intentional because this is the Lord's field, the Lord's building, not mine. I will be gone one day, Lord. Whether it's five minutes from now, or it's five years, or it's 50 years, we need to raise up another generation. We need to be intentional. And it begins in the home. It begins in the home. And this is where kind of he goes. He says, so this is the second point, right? So everything we have is from the Lord, and everything we have will be judged by the Lord. Look what he says in chapter 3, verse 10. Read with me. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one of you take care how he builds upon it. Because no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, when he says this, the foundation is delayed. You don't have to worry about that. Business. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. Don't worry about that. You've, you've come to him, you believe in him, let's move on now. Let's build upon him. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, with silver, with precious stones, with wood, with hay, with straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day. Will become manifest because the day will disclose it. It will be revealed by fire. The fire will test what sort of work one has done in it. He's not talking about hell, beloved. The Bible uses the language of fire oftentimes, just like we often use the language of fire. These were normal people, right? Who spoke normal language. He's using fire here as an image of trial, of testing. Think about even Johnny Cash, the ring of fire. He's not talking about a literal ring of fire. He's talking about a moment of testing, a moment of trial. We use that. That's what he's using here, the image. He's not talking about help. He's talking about a moment of testing, a moment of proving. Because fire does what? It can prove things. It can test them. You take a bar of gold and you melt it. You put it in the fire, it's going to melt. And what's going to happen to all the impurities in the gold? It will rise to the top. And you will be able to tell, huh, that's not 24 karat gold. If you remove all the impurities, then you're left with pure gold. Same thing. You do this with all sorts of metal, with gold, with silver, with precious stones. Same thing with wood, same thing with hay, same thing with straw. The, the fire is able to test it. Will it stand? Will this thing pass through the fire? That's the image he's given to us. He's not talking about hell. What he's saying is, beloved, there are everything we do with what the Lord has given to us, we will have to give an account for. He has given us everything. Everything we have is from the Lord. And He's given it to us so that we can build. We can build with it. And the things we build, the Lord will judge. Were they good? Was there a good stewardship of the things He gave us? Was there a bad stewardship? Will we be able to offer something we are proud of when we stand in front of Him? Or will we be ashamed because we wasted what He gave to us? 
Will the things that we invested our time in be the things that pass through the fire, like gold, like silver, like precious stones? Yeah, it melts, but then once the fire passes through, it still stands, it remains, it survives, that's what he's saying. But he's saying there are some people who are building with wood, they're building with straw, they're building with hay, they're investing all their times on these things that sure, they might look nice, but when the day comes, they will not stand. <coughs> things will not stand. They will have nothing to show. And notice how I know he's not talking about health, because look at what he says in verse 14. If anyone, if the work, notice what's going through the fire here is not the person, it's the work. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he, the person, will receive a reward. <coughs> well done, my good and faithful servant. You are faithful in the little, I will entrust you with much. Verse 15. If work is burnt up, if anyone's work is burnt up, it's not the person being burnt up, it's the work. He will suffer loss. He will look back all these wasted years, all those hours that I invested, all those resources, and he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be what? Saved. But through fire. In other words, it's not going to be a good experience. You see, we have to understand, Paul's trying to get us to understand here that salvation is not just a one ticket. That there's, there's actually something when we get there. There are things we do in this world that will pass on into the other. That there will be people who are saved, who when they stand before God, they will be a little bit ashamed because they'll have nothing to show. And Paul understood this in all his letters. He mentions, at least somewhere, he says this, he says, guys, I am doing all I can. I am struggling, I'm fighting, I'm pressing for because I do not want to stand ashamed. He's not saying because I do not want to lose my salvation. He's not saying because I do not want to, to go to hell. He's saying because I do not want to be ashamed. We need to get past the idea of, oh, I just want to go to heaven rather than hell. That's, that's, that's baby stuff. That's, that's infant stuff. Our language is to be, I want to please the Father. I want to please the Master. I want to take the things He's given to me, and I want to be able to have something to offer. Everything we have will be judged by the Lord, and it will be revealed. Are the things that you are investing your life in things that you will be able to show when you stand before God? Or are they things that perhaps, yes, you may be saved, but you have nothing to show? shame. And I don't understand fully how that works. I just know that that's what it says. And he, he, he then clears this up, verse 16. Do you not know? After all, don't you know this is this common knowledge? Don't you know that you're God's temple? That God's spirit dwells in you? And here it is. Why does the Lord judge? Because if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. God's temple is holy. And you, you are that temple. And this is where I get the idea of we are to use what the Lord has given to us to build one another. Because people, people are the things that we will be able to stand before God and say, oh Lord, you gave me one life and I was able to impact five. I was able to impact ten. I was able to impact a hundred lives. I was able to impact two lives. Because notice what he says. What is it that's going to go through the fire? The work, right? That's going to be tested, whether it survives or whether it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then there will be loss, because it will be destroyed by the fire. Now in verse 16, what is it, or verse 17, what is it that's going to, that, that people are trying to destroy? The temple. And what is the temple? Not this building, not a place. It's what? You. If the Spirit of God dwells in. And so if we're using the things God has given to us to break other people down, to destroy them, to cause them to, to stumble, we will have to answer for that. If we use what we have to lead others into stumbling, because after all, I have Christian liberty, I can do what I want, the Lord will forgive me. We will have to answer for that. 
Rather, we are supposed to use what the Lord has given to us to build one another up, to build the temple of God, to edify one another. Because the Lord temple, his temple is holy. You are the temple. Everything we have has been given to us by God, and so we must boast in him and him alone. Everything we have is, it will be judged by the Lord. And so we must build for him. We must build in accordance to his design. So my question for you is, are you pursuing build for the Lord, or are you pursuing the build for yourself? Where are the treasures that you are storing up? Are they treasures that will rot? Are they treasures that will decay? Believers can do this. That's what he's saying. There are people who are believers who can waste their life. Waste their life storing up treasures that will one day rot. He says, don't be that person. Sure, you'll be saved, but there's a better way. And lastly, he says this. This is verse 18. This is the case then, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool, so that he may become wise. In other words, if the Lord has called you to build, don't use the wisdom of the world. Use the wisdom of the Lord. And if it requires you to be a fool in the eyes of the world, then so be it. Because look at what's going to happen. Look at verse 19. The wisdom of this world is folly with God. It doesn't do anything with God. In fact, he uses a scripture here from the Old Testament. He says, the Lord catches the wise in their craftiness. The craftiness of this world, the wisdom of this world, will be caught up by God. Verse 20, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. They're futile. They're vain. The word here is the word for vapor, in the wind, like a dandelion. They might look bright and big and strong and smart in this age, but when the fire comes through and tests their work, they'll have nothing to show. And if we follow this world's way of thinking, we too will have nothing to show, and we will be ashamed. And the Lord is saying, Beloved, if this is the case, don't deceive yourself. Do away with the wisdom of this world. Do away with the dreams and goals and pursuits of this world. Pursue the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But He doesn't stop there. Notice what He says. Verse 21. Let the one, let no one boast in men. Let no one put their confidence in men. Let no one place their strength in men. Why? Because all things are yours. Whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas, the world, life, death, the present, the future, all are yours and all are Christ and Christ is God. What is he saying here? I think this is what he's saying. I think he's using similar language from Genesis chapter 1. What was the command of the Lord to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and multiply. And then he just dropped them into the middle of a desert and said, Good luck. Is that what he said? No. What did he say? Right after he said that, be fruitful, multiply, what did he say? Look around. I've given you every tree. It's good for fruit. I've given you every plant. I've given you everything you need. Everything we need has been provided by the Lord. So we build by his wisdom. We build by his strength. If he calls us to do something, it's because he's going to give us what we need to accomplish that. The Lord does not call. He doesn't call you because you're equipped. We're not equipped for life. But He equips us when He calls us. If the Lord has called you to do something, then He will equip you to do it. You don't need to worry about the resources. After all, look at the birds in the heavens. They don't worry about resources. Look at the flowers in the field. They don't worry about them. If the Lord has called you to a purpose, He will give you what you need. He called the birds to sing and to fly, and He gives them what they need. He called the flowers to be pretty and stand and give delight to our hearts, and He gives them what they need. He's called us to be His image bearers that build, that be fruitful and multiply, and He will give us what we need. Think about it. Everywhere throughout the Bible, here are the people of Israel leaving Egypt. Oh no, there's a sea. We're doomed. 
the Egyptians are coming, the Red Sea is in front of us, the Lord says to Moses, Moses, just cross. But there's a sea. Just cross, Moses. Just go. And they walk. And there goes the sea. Boom. Oh, we're in the desert. There's no water. What are we going to do? Moses, go talk to that rock. And there's water. Oh, we're in the desert. There's no food. There's manna. Oh, no. There's a Jordan River now. How are we ever going to cross into the promised land? The Lord says, just cross. And they cross, and the Jordan River opens. And then Jesus with his disciple. There's 10,000 people here. And his disciple says, Jesus, send them home. These people are going to start nagging. They're hungry. They're angry. There's women. You know what happens when women get angry. And Jesus says, what? Just feed them. Just feed them. And the disciple says, what? All we have is a handful of fish and bread. He says, don't worry about that. Just feed them. And what happens? Feed them. If the Lord has called you to do something, He will provide the means to do it. He will provide the resources. And so many people, if we don't understand this, we will be paralyzed with fear and we will never accomplish anything. If the Lord has called you to do something, just do it. He will provide the resources. Don't live in fear. He is, look what he says, Paul, all things are yours. Paul, Paul, Cephas, the world, life, death, the present, the future, Christ. Christ wants to get you. You have everything you need to be obedient to the Lord. And so you might be thinking, well, where can I start? Right? And this dawned on me this week, uh, or a couple weeks, and then it kind of clarified this week. I think a good place to start, there's two good places. In the first place is the very single place, the very same place where you complain. If, think about it. When you find yourself in a position where you look at someone else or you look at something and you feel inside of you, I don't like, I don't like that. I don't like the way it looks. That's not right. And you start complaining. Ugh, these people don't know what they're doing. How can you say that? How can you do that? Why are they letting this happen? Why are they letting you do this? Why are they doing that? Why are they just... When we start complaining, why is it that we complain? It's because we are seeing something that perhaps other people aren't seeing. Right? If I'm seeing something that I think is not right, and I'm complaining, it's because other people aren't doing anything about it. Now think about this. Why is it that I am seeing that and other people aren't? Is it just because I'm better? Or could it be that the Lord has given me the eyes to see this problem so that I could be part of a way to fix the problem. So if you find yourself complaining about something, then maybe the Lord is calling you to be the one to bring about a solution. So that rather than bickering, you go and build. Rather than complaining, you go and construct. There you go, easy turn on. You find yourself complaining about something, perhaps the Lord has given you the eyes to see the problem. And, as we see here, if he's called you to see the problem, then he will give you what you need to fix the problem. That's the first way. Anything you see that you complain, perhaps the Lord is calling you to be the one to bring about a solution. The second way is also to do with complaining. The first one is complaining about other people, other places, other things. And the second thing, which is the thing I often that often comes to my mind, is complaining about my own situation. When you find yourself complaining, why is this happening to me? Why did this happen? Why do I have this? Why do I not have that? Why is it that they have that and I don't have that? And I am led to complaining, or you're led to complaining. Could it be that that very thing that you complain about, the situation you find yourself in, the disease that you have, the need that you have, the problem that you have, could be the instrument that the Lord has given you to build up his kingdom. That maybe the disease that you have, maybe the, the, the difficulty in finances that you have, maybe the struggles that you have are meant to be not reasons to complain, but actual reasons to show that we don't we can accomplish things in a way that the world doesn't understand. Because our strength is not found in forces and chariots and money and power, but it's found in the Spirit of God. 
And so I think that what we can do is anytime we find ourselves complaining about someone or something, we need to remind ourselves, maybe the Lord is calling me. That's why I'm seeing this. No one else is seeing this. Maybe I'm seeing this problem because he's called me to fix this problem. Maybe there's this family that has an issue that bothers me. Maybe the Lord is calling me to invest in this family rather than complain about them. There's this person who does this and says this and I can't stand it. Maybe the Lord is calling you to build into their lives. Or I have this problem, ah, this disease or this, this situation in my life, the location I find myself in. Maybe you're there because the Lord is wanting to use you there to show people that it doesn't require a healthy body to be a healthy person. You don't have to walk, to live, right, Pierce? You don't have to be rich in finances to be rich in the heavenly treasures. You don't have to have the greatest intellect. You can show people that you can serve God even though you might not have finished high school. The problems we have are often the perfect way for us to show the world what it's like to be His holy people because that then elevates the power of God. The Lord will always provide. So that's why I have this little vest here. You said, you want to borrow her? <laughs> Jessica and I had the, the fortitude, fortitude, you know, we were fortunate to be raised in a family, both, both of our families, that from day one we were instilled in us. It's better to give than to receive. From day one, you always give to the Lord first. And whatever's left over, we'll use for us. You always serve first, because the Lord will always provide. You don't worry about tomorrow. From day one, both of our families, that was just natural. Just natural. My, I grew up hearing my grandfather say, the Lord will provide. He would get home, my mom tells a story, after he would get his monthly salary in, in, a, in cash, they would sit around the dinner table, and he would take out the Lord's offering, whether it was to give to the church, or to give to a needy family, or to provide in other ways for the, the kingdom work, and then he would start counting for the electricity, for the, well they didn't have electricity in the house, but for the, for the house, for the food, and oftentimes they would get to the end of their needs, and there would be no one don't have any leftovers for, for groceries. And my mom and my uncle would say, Daddy, what are we going to do? Can we just take from what we were going to give to the church or to the, that laborer, to that poor family? And his phrase was always the same. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. How dare I lack, not sacrifice to the Lord from what he's given to me just so I can guarantee my comfort. And so Jessica and I, we were blessed with the opportunity to be raised in families like this, that from day one, it's better to give than to receive. If we have it, it's because we have it, so we can use it to help others. And the Lord will care for us. It's okay if we want to know what's going to come next. And the nine years that we've been married, the Lord has just blessed and blessed and blessed in different ways. Sometimes it's financial ways, sometimes it's non-financial ways, but the Lord has provided non-stop. Constantly. And we have tested and we have tried, but we have seen this is true. That when you give to the Lord, whether it's your time, whether it's your finances, whether it's your energy, He will give back to you. It might not be finances. It might be another way. But when you give to the Lord, He gives back to you. He gives you more. That's 2 Corinthians. That's the second letter that Paul writes. If you are faithful in the Lord, the Lord will bless you with more. And so this best. As I said, Jessica and I, we do our best. I'm not trying to brag or boast. Paul uses examples. But we do our best to use what we have to bless those around us. Not because we want anything from people. That's why we're hosting you guys for dinner or lunch over this house. Because we, we, God has given to us, so we want to be able to give. We want to be able to bless other people in the hope that people will bless others. And so we were at Goodwill yesterday. Because that's where we high rollers shop sometimes. We're Goodwill. The Lord calls us to be good stewards of our resources. So we were at Goodwill, and I was walking, and I, and I saw this dashing vest hanging. I was like, man, I've always wanted one of those. So I put it on. I was like, hey, perfect size. 
And I'm walking around the store, looking around, and I go, oh, they even have pockets. <laughs> Hold on a second. Am I feeling what I'm feeling? And I, I pull it off. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. Well, I have to buy this vest now. It's like the it's like the field. I had the treasure and I had to sell everything so I can buy the field. And I won't, I, I believe perfectly clear. That's just that's not the first time things like that have happened. The Lord provides. The Lord provides. Whether it's through random checks we've received in the mail sometimes, the house store has sent us money before, I don't know why, which it did. Whether it's random money finding in pockets, or whether it's that the flower in the jar will last longer than it's supposed to, like it did with Elijah. Whether it's that the gas in my car will last longer than it's supposed to. The Lord provides. Take him at his word. And if we don't do that, we cannot be united. Because then we'll look at somebody that has a better situation than us and we'll say, ah, they're only generous because they have more money than we do. Or, oh, look at these people, they're not generous at all. But yet they might, rather than give financially, they might give up their time, they might give up their prayers, they might give up their service. We need to train our way, our minds to think like this. Everything the Lord calls us to do, He will provide. Amen? Let's pray. Lord our God and Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that you are the source of every good and every perfect gift. We give you thanks that you will uh, one day show that the works that we have done were worth it all. You will prove that the time we invested, the money that we gave, the prayers that we gave, the services that we did, that the investments, the, the things that we built, the people we invested in, that they were worth it. And we pray, oh God, that you would spare us from wasting our life. We pray, oh God, that you would help us to trust in you, knowing that you will provide. In the name of the Lord Jesus.